All right, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to Archeo Viking. Today uh, I have a uh, guest, uh, a uh, friend of mine, a mutual historian uh, on uh, who specializes in Northern Europe, uh, Beofeld. Uh, and today uh, we are going to uh, Beofeld and I are going to talk about um, Norse colonization. Um, and the reason we are talking about this is because in recent weeks in social media, there has been a large debate uh, that has since somewhat petered out, uh, but it's still going on about whether or not the Norse colonized uh, in the Viking Age, um, which Beofeld and I are of the opinion that they did. So, Oh, 100 percent. Yes, yes. Uh, now we should state, and we'll probably state this several times throughout the video, uh, Norse colonization was not to the same level uh, or scope as colonization that happened after 1492 uh, with European powers such as France, England, Spain, um, and the Dutch and Portuguese. Uh, yeah. But they most definitely did colonize. So, Nor was it exactly for the same purposes, but yes, they absolutely did colonize. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, uh, one of the first things we're going to cover, you know, what is the Viking Age and who are uh, the Vikings? Well, roughly the Viking Age uh, is an event uh, that happened um, officially starting in 793 CE where uh, Scandinavian pirates um, and eventually <laughs> uh, military leaders expanded out of Scandinavia uh, into Western Europe um, for a variety of reasons, trade, um, raiding, uh, setting up new homes, uh, whether it be through conquest or uh, just simply settling there. Uh, but either way, they expanded out of Scandinavia uh, and into the West. Um, and the reason I say officially began in 793 is, um, and Beofeld can uh, back me up on this, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle actually mentions uh, earlier raids uh, by Norse uh, pirates, uh, specifically uh, on the kingdom of Offa, the legendary, uh, the, not legendary, the well-known uh, individual who's found in the um, uh, grave in England uh, in 787. Only that raid didn't end so well for the uh, for the Danes who landed there. They were uh, summarily uh, hunted down and killed, um, which is probably why it wasn't thought of for for centuries as the first <laughs> Viking raid. <laughs> <laughs> because it, it didn't end well. And also, it should be noted that raids had also happened earlier, uh, albeit at a far less frequent um, events, uh, such as uh, Gregory of Tours, uh, the historian for uh, the Frankish kings in the 500s CE, uh, mentions Danish raids on uh, a region called Frisia, which is the region we now know as uh, the Netherlands and Belgium. Uh, by Danish kings, specifically a Danish king who may or may not be the inspiration for both Hrothgar and Beowulf. Um, but those are definitely different than the Viking Age, when the Viking Age began just the large-scale raids pretty much every year uh, for 200 years or longer. So one of the uh, ways we view the Viking Age is this map right here, where you see uh, them expanding everywhere west, uh, east, and even south. Um, I don't really like this map that much because it doesn't really show everywhere they went uh, in great detail. For example, the uh, Kiev and Rus kingdom is not really shown, uh, but this will give a general idea of sort of how the Viking expansion out of Scandinavia went. And one of their first areas to go to was Ireland. And Ireland, uh, unlike England, where they would eventually uh, settle as well, was far more divided uh, into, I've seen a number of between 50 to 100 petty kingdoms. Um, and various different kings set up cities uh, 
sorry, set up camps that eventually became cities uh, called long forts, where they would use them as uh, ground, base grounds and, you know, bases to come out and raid various other areas. Um, and eventually they did become rather large cities. And we know of one today that is actually the capital of Ireland, Dublin. Um, and one of the reasons this definitely fits within the context of colonization and the definition of colonization that we know it is because one, they imposed uh, foreign rule on uh, these Irish kingdoms. Uh, because despite common belief, um, and one of the arguments that I've seen most commonly is that these were independent kingdoms outside of uh, Scandinavian rule, which for one thing, so what, uh, the Plymouth colony, for example, was uh, a colony that did not fall under the rule of the British kingdom. In fact, they specifically called themselves separatists, so for, uh, so, so what? But another thing is they were, for a good chunk of their history, actually ruled by the Norwegian kings. Uh, we know this from a variety of uh, sources, such as the uh, Orkney sagas uh, and the Fjord sagas, and etc. So uh, there's that. And then also, um, one of the biggest signs and effects of colonialism uh, across the board, whether it be 17, uh, 1492 uh, and onwards or now, is slavery. Um, and the Norse were masters at taking people and selling them in the slave markets. In fact, that's the largest effect that happened to Ireland is so much of their population uh, was taken away as slaves by these uh, Norse uh, petty kings. In fact, uh, as we'll touch on a little later, uh, recent genetic evidence uh, has shown that a sizable uh, portion of the population that settled Iceland was actually Irish and mostly from these slaves. And they would take these slaves to a variety of markets uh, in Constantinople, um, on the Eurasian steppe, uh, to the Khazars and the uh, Volga Bulgars, uh, and in other European uh, ports, uh, even in England and France. Uh, so, that's the first notch in the belt that they did, in fact, colonize. They came here and posed influence and permanently uh, reshaped the genetic and uh, political and geographical uh, map of Ireland. And then we have the colonies of Scotland. Um, which were colonized around the same time as Ireland, uh, specifically the Shetlands, the Orkneys, and the uh, Hebrides uh, Islands. Um, and the almost immediate effect of this colonization was the destruction of the native Picts. The Picts were the original settlers, not the Scots. The Scots were latecomers, uh, much like the Norse. Um, and in fact, they arrived within a few hundred years of each other. Uh, and it was this Norse colonization where they uh, began hunting down these few remaining picked settlements uh, and either killing them off or taking them and selling them in slave markets to the point where uh, in the Orkneys, Shetlands, and Hebrides, uh, there were no picks left, um, at least as far as we can tell, in both the archaeological and genetic record, which usually means that they don't, they didn't exist anymore uh, at all. Um, and as far as I know, uh, and Bayfield can correct me if I'm wrong, no Anglo Saxon sources mention picks after this. Uh, is that correct, Bayfield? No, there were no more picks. Yes, that is exactly what I thought. Uh, so there you go. There's another example of. Uh, Norse colonization, and much like Ireland, uh, these were, for uh, most of their history, ruled by Norwegian kings. Uh, in fact, um, one of the most well-known Norwegian kings um, uh, who converted Christianity, the the guy uh, <laughs> Olaf uh, Tugvinson, 
who believed he was better than four, according to his account, his sagas, uh, supposedly came personally here and converted everyone. Um, as Bayfeld, who's read the same thing, the same sagas, will tell you, he's was pretty full of himself. Uh, so, uh, most definitely, they were ruled by an outside dynasty. <clears throat> And then the next one, uh, one of the by far largest ones, was the Kievan Rus that was founded in 865 um, and by Rurik, Rurik and his uh, Swedish dynasty and encompassed this large area that you see here. Um, and that is, you know, pretty much the size of it. Uh, there's some leeway as to how big or small it was, but that's generally how big it was. Um, and while, while they were ruled by one king, it should also be noted that they were also sort of city-states. They had each their own minor kings. Um, high kings were very common in Celtic and Germanic uh, culture, i.e. a king who's the big guy, but there are lesser kings under them. So the Kievan Rus uh, colonized, this, colonized this region in 860. Uh, 865 CE um, and quickly became the largest kingdom in Eastern Europe. Uh, and it flourished from uh, trade, especially the slave trade and trade links with Asia. Um, even uh, as evidence has re recent evidence has shown, going as far uh, as uh, China, albeit indirectly, but still they had trade connections with China. But what makes this uh, kingdom a prime example for colonization is <laughs> the, the, the effect they had on the region, uh, an effect that's actually more brutal than the previous two, than the uh, Scottish colonies and the Irish colonies. And that's because, of one, the Kievan Rus uh, at first had a trade and trade relations with um, the uh, Slavs and the nomadic tribes uh, of the Khazars and the Volga Bulgars, uh, much in a similar way that France and Britain uh, and originally had uh, trade relations uh, with uh, the indigenous Americans um, before they started uh, picking them off one by one through essentially subterfuge. Uh, and that's what exactly happened with the Kievan Rus, is they decided they wanted to be the big boys on the block rather than sharing the trade with the Khazars and the Volga Bulgars. Um, and so what they did is they launched a surprise campaign out of nowhere on both of these uh, kingdoms um, and thoroughly decimated their kingdoms, uh, selling most of them to slavery and subjugating the rest. Um, in terms of the Khazars and doing generally the same to the Volga Bulgars, only they actually allowed the Bulgars to remain somewhat uh, intact so long as they were a vassal kingdom, uh, while also taking their population to be sold into slavery. Uh, which, again, and I'll, I'll repeat this multiple times before the video is over, fits right in the definition that we know that we use for uh, colonization. And then also, uh, they were responsible for the spread of Orthodox Christianity into Eastern Europe. I'm sorry, people, and I'm sorry, uh, Viking lovers who are obsessed with the show of Vikings. Uh, it was actually most of the time the Norse themselves who were responsible for the spread of Christianity into uh, regions they controlled. Um, especially a figure we'll get into a little in a little bit, uh, Nook the Great, but so were the uh, Kievan Rus. In fact, uh, while we can take this account with a grain of salt, um, Zvatislav, uh, the king who eventually uh, converted to Orthodox Christianity, decided he was bored with paganism, uh, which uh, Beefeld and I do not agree with, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> and he sent out emissaries to uh, the Muslim caliphates, to the Pope, and to the Byzantine Empire. And he eventually decided on Orthodox Christianity. 
uh, and then began forcing Orthodox Christianity on everyone he could, much like Olaf Tjernson. So <laughs> uh, there's a pattern here. Uh, and that includes the few surviving Khazars who were actually Jewish. They converted to Ju uh, Judaism because for a time they were one of the largest military powers in the region and they felt converting to Judaism rather than Christianity and, or Islam would allow them to remain uh, independent. So again, fits right within the definition of colonization where you force your religion on some uh, on some weaker populace uh, under threat of death. And then we have uh, the Danelaw colony. So the Danelaw was founded in 1865 after the Danish and Norwegian, uh, mostly Danish, but there were Norwegians in there, uh, Great Heathen Army conquered much of England and imposed uh, Scandinavian rule on Anglo-Saxon and Celtic subjects. Um, and I, in a minute, I'm going to pass this section off to Beofeld because this is right in his wheelhouse uh, in terms of uh, his specialty, which is Anglo-Saxon history. Uh, but first, uh, one of the things I want to bring up is the, uh, an argument that I heard was that the laws were not imposed on the people by the Danes. They were imposed on the people by Alfred the Great. Um, and that's untrue. Uh, at least for the most part. What, what it was was that he imposed the boundary, uh, the border between his kingdom of Wessex and the Dane law. Nothing else. He signed a treaty, uh, for, got Guthrum to convert to Christianity, uh, who was the leader of the Dane law at the time, and that was it. In fact, Guthrum promptly about a year later decided he uh, didn't want peace anymore and invaded. Um, and this is backed <laughs> up by the fact that uh, the, most of the laws in the Dane law were Scandinavian in origin, such as ideas of home gang uh, and various other things, which so if, if Alfred the Great imposed this law on the, the Anglo-Saxon subjects of the, of the Norwegians and Danes, why would he put scan make it made up of mostly Scandinavian laws. So that argument is ridiculous and is not backed up by the sources. But I'm gonna pass uh, this section on to Bayfell because like I said, this is in his wheelhouse and this is why I invited him on. So Bayfell, describe uh, ge the general like makeup of uh, England at the time, and of course, you know, what was going on culturally uh, and such. And also, I want you, as we talked about earlier, I'd like you to cover the idea that the Anglo-Saxons, whether or not the Anglo-Saxons completely destroyed and massacred the uh, original population of England. All right, so uh, we got to take a step backwards then, I suppose, and um, <laughs> talk about the, uh, the Anglo-Saxons. The Anglo-Saxons were uh, colonizers as well. They essentially colonized what was the Romano-British sort of area here that we come to know as, uh, as England. Um, so this area of Britannia, this, uh, this area that had been under Roman control uh, as the Roman Empire was sort of falling apart, uh, which it did you know, over a period of a couple hundred of years, um, but as it was falling apart, uh, the Anglo-Saxons began to migrate in uh, and conquer the areas that they were um, migrating into and putting themselves over the people that lived there. Uh, and so there was, for a time, this sort of myth that they killed all of those people. Uh, it just doesn't pan out because we've done genetic studies and we've done all sorts of things. And uh, well, let's just put it like this. They integrated those people into uh, Anglo-Saxon society, which means that those people that had been <laughs> in effect converted into Christianity for a lot of that, uh, that, that period in time, they essentially became pagan again. Uh, and uh, they converted the language, they converted the culture. You even see a, a shift in burial practices where 
the uh, the burials become uh, oriented more towards what the Anglo-Saxon burials would have been. Uh, and so rather than being a, uh, um, uh, a they didn't kill them, uh, they essentially killed their culture uh, and then replaced it with their own culture. Uh, and so by this point that we're looking at here, a lot has changed since that too. The Anglo-Saxons were through that entire area. All of those parts that have color on them were Anglo-Saxon. Uh, and of course, we have to understand, remember that, uh, that these were Anglo-Saxons that had um, probably a, a huge substantial <laughs> uh, makeup of their genetics was not actually Anglo-Saxon, um, but had, grown up within that Anglo-Saxon culture, uh, speaking what would be Old English at that point in time, uh, is what we call the language. Uh, and uh, at this point, they would have all become Christian. And so they were quite thoroughly Christian uh, by this point, by uh, nearly a couple hundred years. Uh, and so they were then being conquered by this invading force which was not Christian, which is not necessarily something which would be quite nice for them to, uh, to have to undergo, uh, given their sort of understanding of Danes uh, and uh, all of these people. And so what you see here, this, uh, this area of the Dane law, this Norse territory, it would have been something that they would definitely not have wanted to occur. Uh, it is, uh, it, it would honestly be, um, it's, it's pretty bad business for, uh, for the Christians to have been conquered by a, uh, a non-Christian force. Um, and so the laws would have been opposed, uh, sorry, imposed by the, uh, the Norse, uh, and the, uh, the uh, sort of culture that had been uh, overlaid on top of this. Uh, they managed not to be converted <laughs> back to paganism because the Dane law doesn't last particularly long. And there was sort of a, a tacit Christianity that's overlaid on top of this as well. Uh, and so there's actually some Christianization that goes uh, onto the colonizers uh, as part of this as well. Let's see, what else did you want me to cover with that? Oh, that, that, that pretty much fits. Uh, you know, and also one of the things I did want to cover um, and, and both of us to cover, you know, one of the arguments I heard, um, and it's a dumb argument in itself, uh, is talking about the <laughs> supposedly the, the, this was an even battle between two rival kingdoms and that the Norse did not have um, an advantage or, or at least a big advantage, which is wrong. I mean, okay, so for one thing, the, the Anglo-Saxons were relatively the same general technological advancement of uh, this time period in medieval era. But the thing is, the Norse had quite a few advantages over the people, technological advantages over the people that they were uh, raiding across the board. For one thing, the a lot of people uh, have heard of uh, the Ulfbert swords, which are swords that um, combined uh, Frankish and Europe and um, Muslim forging practices uh, to make ridiculously strong swords that were also flexible enough to be bent and then returned to the original shape, something the Anglo-Saxons did not have. In fact, tests of these swords have shown that they could bust through their um, shields and pierce uh, mail, which was the armor of the time. I'm sorry, people who watch things like uh, Excalibur or other things that make <laughs> it look like that plain armor existed at the time. It didn't. It was mail. It was, it was, there were a few types of mail, but there, it was all mail and these swords could pierce them. And then also there's their ships. The long ships were uh, the best ships of the time in the North Sea. 
uh, I will I, I add that caveat because the Muslim kingdoms and the Byzantine Empire had better navies across the board. But in Western Europe and in Northern Europe, the Norse had the best ships across the board, and including technology that the other uh, cultures didn't have, which was a type of tar they would use to put on their ships to make them more watertight, as well as to put them on their sails to make them uh, catch wind better and also resistant to fire. And then there's also, uh, the last one I'm going to bring up is the, uh, the sun compass, uh, which allowed them to uh, find their way on cloudy days. Uh, and it's actually been tested multiple times to be r pretty accurate. There are multiple papers that I'll link in the sources that talk about how well they were able to use this. So uh, generally, uh, that's why uh, the North had an advantage. And also they were, uh, the, the Great Heathen Army was actually, had a central um, authority versus the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms that were divided up and squabbling amongst each other uh, before that. So, Beifa, would you say that's a rather, that, would you say that's a decent um, uh, summary of the advantage that they had? Well, yes, they, they did have those things. But, uh, but I'd also like to stress the fact that this is sort of par for the course. This is something that we see happening uh, essentially throughout history. I mean, we look yeah. at the Anglo-Saxons when they invaded the, uh, the areas that were controlled by the Romano-British. Yeah. Uh, it's not necessarily that there was some huge advantage. It's simply the fact that they won and the others lost and uh, history sort of marched on after that. Exactly. Uh, and so these are, these are relatively evenly matched. But one thing that we sort of have to take into consideration is the fact that um, once you capture an area and uh, the, the, the ruling structure being the way that it is, uh, you just sort of like have to lop off its head and insert yourself in that spot. Yeah. So if you are able to kill the lords, then you're the lord, and you don't have any rivals to that because everybody has their own place that they're already looking after. And so it's not like they're going to try and come get rid of you now because they don't like you because you're a Dane. Um, <laughs> it, they. Uh, they have their own problems you know it, it they um there's so in uh, in in our modern sort of like uh, our modern sort of like idea of war has more to do with the crusades than it does to do with anything like this yes because um when uh, when you go on the crusades you're trying to right some wrong someplace over on the far side of the world so like uh so think about uh, america's missions to the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Essentially, we're just trying to right some wrong as we perceive it on the other side of the world. Even when we go into Europe in World War II, we're trying to right some wrong on the other side of the world in, in a lot of ways, although they did have to uh, poke us in the eye for us to be able to, uh, to get involved. But, but regardless, those are different sorts of warfare than what we see occurring here, which is essentially lop off the head step in and take that position and take that place and these people they didn't understand things the same way that we do there wasn't going to be some like um uh underground trying to resist these people they didn't think that way and so if these people had someone step into the position of lord that was their lord then uh they they sort of followed those new rules because they're now the head honcho they're the guys that you pay your taxes to now mm -hmm. exactly and that's you know and that's one of the things i wanted to bring up and why i brought it up is because that argument um of of uh, a coloni of a colonizing force being more advanced than the group they're colonizing um 
has it well for one thing it has its roots in racism for uh, and that that's essentially it and that's why i want to bring it up is because that argument has been used as a uh excuse for the colonization of the americas oh the spanish and the french and such they were this massive um indomitable force who in, invaded the aztec empire and overthrew it invaded the incan empire and overthrew it when it's like well okay for one thing no uh, i mean they did conquer them but but the spanish but the spanish uh french and british until the 17 and 1800s actually lost more battles than they won by quite a lot and in fact uh the accounts of pedro pizarro uh that he wrote when he um saw the incan army when they uh, did succeed in capturing atahualpa um under subterfuge and uh things like that uh and under <laughs> ruse of, and under ruse of making them think that they were gonna sign some sort of treaty or something uh when he saw the incan army approach he, he he writes in the accounts that the soldiers were pissing themselves out of fear uh and then there's also the great inca i hate this title for it because it's it's implies that the spanish were actually uh ruling the inca when they weren't uh but the great inca revolt where again the spanish lost more battles than they won uh, and they only won because the final battle where the massive Incan army was laying siege to uh, modern day Lima, uh, Peru, is because the leader happened to be at the front and the Spanish were able to, as Bayerfeld put it, chop off the head, uh, chop off the head um, of the army. Uh, and without their leader, uh, they scattered. And then that's not also not also not bringing up the uh, night of tears as it's called the la noche trista uh where uh after cortez killed montezuma the aztec army was like oh okay so all so we're uh we're not uh pretending anymore hey well <laughs> have fun with this and then they proceeded to slaughter most of the spaniards uh and most of his uh indian allies and he barely escaped with his life uh and then had to go get help from another indian kingdom that was similar in power to the uh aztec or as it's more popular properly called the triple alliance uh and with indian help won the battle and you see this just repeat over and over again with the french with the british with the spanish uh the dutch etc so this whole idea of a colonizing force being better and being more powerful uh is wrong and is rooted in racism to justify the colonization of the Aztec and the Inca and the American South uh, East, which, by the way, DeSoto in his accounts describes uh, the uh, tribes of the Southeast, uh, their uh, bows and atlatls as being more uh, useful than their uh, muskets and crossbows uh, and actually could pierce their armor uh, just as well as a musket uh, could as well and then describes also their forts being uh too difficult to besiege uh, and things like that so again all the accounts speak for themselves and so making this claim that it can't be colonization unless a kingdom is weaker uh than the ones invading is wrong and it ignores the history that actually happened and it ignores the history of the indigenous peoples uh that suffered this because then it makes them it feeds into the narrative that they it was going to happen uh eventually uh because they were you know just going to disappear because of progress um so i'm gonna get off my high horse for that but that's sort of what we're trying to get at is uh they did you know the the norse and the danes did have some advantages you know but only because they were the new guys on the block and that didn't mean that they were more advanced than anybody because as Bayfield said this is just par for the course throughout history where oh somebody comes up with something new um and they're still relatively equal to the other kingdoms they just happen to win because of, of one or two minor changes and also because again the anglo-saxon kingdoms were fighting amongst themselves and it's hard to 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 fight a unified force when you're you know beating each other up so 
so now we're we're gonna go uh, onto the Iceland colony, uh, which is where we get most of our sources uh, from on um, you know Norse uh, colonization and mythology. Uh, with the exception of a few, but uh, that's not the video we're covering. And it was founded in 872 CE, roughly, uh, by mostly Norwegian settlers. But they also had a very sizable uh, population of Irish, mostly slaves. And in fact, most the most recent genetic evidence shows that they uh, were uh, about 23 to... Uh, even 40% of the population, um, which is, sh again, shows right there uh, what happened in terms of colonization in Ireland, because they brought these people with them, uprooted them from their homeland, and then forced them to move to some volcanic frozen island in the middle of the North Atlantic, <laughs> uh, which de definitely reads a lot of similarities to uh, the transatlantic slave trade. I don't. I want to make very clear that while I say that, I don't want anybody thinking that it is the same. It is most definitely not the same. It just is something that rhymes. History doesn't repeat itself. It rhymes. That's one thing that yeah. uh, that I like to point out when it comes to this uh, is 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 quite an uncomfortable fact indeed. But when we look at the genetic evidence of the uh, the the presence of this sort of like irish admixture into the uh the, the scandinavian uh sort of like gene pool there mm. that would be non-consensual yeah this is uh this is this is sexual violence that we're seeing occur uh and so what we're looking at here is uh, is really some reprehensible stuff yes very. Um, this is uh <laughs> when we look at those genetic markers uh, a lot of people like to point and say, oh, look how bohemian they were. They're such a multicultural society. Uh, no, that's not what that means. This means yeah. that those people were there against their will. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, and they were non-consensual uh, um, partners in this. They uh, They, are we allowed to say it in this one? I mean, I, I have no issue with it. Uh, yeah, they were they were raped. They were most definitely they, raped. Absolutely. So all of those people that uh, that have that that Irish ancestry, they are the product of the rape of slaves. Yeah, and that's exactly it. And that again is a hallmark of uh, what we describe in colonization, in our modern idea of colonization, like the the rape of. Uh, indigenous people, the rape of uh, Africans who were brought to the Americas as slave as slaves, et cetera, et cetera. And that's, you know, uh, and again, we're not saying at all that this is to the same scope and brutality that is uh, col European colonization after 1492. In fact, we're saying the opposite, but we're, we are saying that this fits within that definition, regardless of whether or not it was just to the same uh, scope and brutality. Uh, you will, yeah. yeah they, I, it's definitely colonization, and yeah. uh, it definitely has all those hallmarks. Yeah. One of the problems, though, is, is that the um, th this is a pretty huge scope uh, for uh, for for this time period. Yeah. Um, this is a such a huge scope that it's left this mark on <laughs> the gene pool, even to this day. Hey, uh so i mean this is uh this is some big stuff so i i wouldn't even like uh downplay it at all no. compared to the uh the modern stuff this is this is some pretty hefty stuff yes exactly um and so there's that and then also uh they were again like i said earlier it, it was actually for the most part uh the scandinavians who were responsible for uh, the spread of Christianity uh, through most of the places they went to, and this is actually it. Now, I made a, a typo. It says 100 CE. It was actually 1,000 CE, so I apologize. Oh, yes. For yes, that it. should be a 1,000 uh, CE. It's a 1,000 CE, um, but yeah, convert, they completely converted to Christianity uh, by 1,000 CE with a few exceptions, um, and it's- They took a vote. Yeah, they took a vote, and, and they allowed- some people to 
as so long as they kept it indoors, this whole idea of, you know, uh, uh, don't uh, don't speak, don't tell, you know, uh, don't share, share, don't tell, etc. Uh, thing. Um, don't ask, don't tell. That's it. Don't ask, don't tell. Yeah. Uh, is is you know they were like, oh, you can it's, if you so long as you keep it in the house and don't tell us about it, you can do it. But that only lasted for roughly about a hundred years, and then it was completely stamped out. Um, so. The, again, this is they're responsible for the spread of Christianity uh, into the region. Then we have uh, a, an interesting uh, uh, little addition to this colonization, and that is the Normandy colony. And it was founded uh, around 911 CE by Rolf the Ganger. Um, or Rollo, uh, is his French, uh, the French version of his name was, uh, after swelling, uh, swearing uh, nominal fealty to, uh, <laughs> to Charles the Lame, uh, the French king of the time. And he also, <laughs> he also converted sort of to Christianity. The thing is, he was also, while he was praying to the Christian God, uh, he was also sacrificing to uh the uh, to the norse gods as well in fact he sacrificed uh priests of of all things to uh the norse gods now to be fair um as Bayfeld and i will both tell you being historians this was from a christian source so take it with a grain of salt but uh it's the best we can say right now because it's the only source that we have uh talking about that um so for the sake of the video we're, we're gonna assume he did it he did sacrifice uh monks <laughs> to the norse gods um and then he proceeded uh for the rest of his life uh and so did his grandchildren to expand into other regions of france so you see in the corner there <laughs> with the number 911 that was his original colony and then he decided no i'm gonna conquer more and then more and then uh, yeah and then kept that going um so which is <laughs> so he colonized and tricked the french king into letting them stay there by becoming christian air quotes um and then proceeded to kick the crap out of uh the king's other subjects and take their land and forced and forced each lord's uh vassals to become his vassals um which again fits within uh the more broader uh colonization definition uh and these actually set up uh the event eventual continued conquests of those of norman descent well into the 13th century um and something i do want to also cover is you know this whole idea of assimilation uh that the the danes and the normans didn't colonize because they assimilated with the local population um for one thing full assimilation of the normans into french society didn't occur until the 1050s uh in fact they had alliances with uh the danish north sea empire uh with sven forfeard and his son nook the great um and had marriage alliances and could also still understand norwegian uh but you know but also they continued having a sort of norse french mix society until the 1050s 16 years before <laughs> william the conqueror conquered england so the whole idea that they uh, assimilated uh therefore do therefore doesn't count uh doesn't make sense especially considering when you look at colonization after 1492 where um, the French uh, and the Americas uh, were by far uh, less uh, populated in the Americas than the uh, Spanish and the British. Uh, and so they opted to work with the indigenous Americans rather than either try to conquer them like the Spanish did or try to turn them against each other like the British did. Uh, and they actually also assimilated with uh, various uh, indigenous tribes, such as the Mi'kmaq uh, and the Haudenosaunee, or uh, more commonly known as the uh, Iroquois, uh, but more properly known as the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, uh, and things like that. And then also we have 
in the southeast, the Scottish, uh, Irish, and uh, Germans who migrated into Cherokee uh, and Creek territory and Choctaw territory and such uh, also intermarried uh, because uh, German, Scandinavian, and Scottish and Irish uh, spiritual beliefs are very similar to Indigenous American beliefs. Um, not not one to one, uh, but they were similar en enough that they have felt a camaraderie and they intermarried. In fact, quite a lot of Cherokee uh, were uh, part uh, Scottish or German or Irish. Um, even uh, in as far as in the 1800s, uh, John Ross, the longtime principal chief of the Cherokee, he was only one eighth Cherokee. He was mostly Scottish. Yet we're not we're not claiming that the British, the Scottish, the Irish, and Germans never colonized. So if we're not claiming that they didn't colonize, why would we do the same to the Norse? You know that to me that seems like a, a, a no true Scotsman fallacy, uh, essentially. Uh, or you know, like the idea that oh, a Christian person. Uh, is rude and horrible, therefore they're not a real Christian, which is not how that works. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. And then we have possibly the most famous colonies of the Norse, uh, <laughs> the, the Greenland and the Vinland colonies. <laughs> the Greenland colony was founded in 985 CE by Eric the Red, who, <laughs> who only went there because just about every place he lived in, he got he banished for murdering somebody. At least that's what the, the Greenland sagas and Eric the Red sagas say. So, so uh, there's that. But um, he found Greenland, and yes, the, the, the story that everyone hears, oh, he called it Greenland to get people to come there despite it not being green. That's exactly it. That's exactly what the sagas say. Uh, that... Uh, Unlike a lot of myths about the, the Viking Age, this one is actually real. <laughs> so that's exactly what happened. Um, and what's interesting about the Greenland colony is it uh, actually lasted until the 1300s, despite being in a desolate place, because they had a lucrative trade in walrus ivory. So what they would do is they would hunt walrus uh, and kill them for their tusks and they would sell walrus ivory back into markets into Europe. And in fact, it spurred the European economy and it's one of the reasons uh, that the early Middle Ages moved into the high Middle Ages because the, the mark between the early Middle Ages uh, to the high Middle Ages is an increase in economy, an increase in learning. Sorry, people, I should also say that the early Middle Ages was not the Dark Ages. Uh, there was a lot, some uh, decline in education and reading, but not as much as the Victorian area would like you to think. Um, but uh, the High Middle Ages is completely different because then you begin to see these large unified kingdoms, these large trade markets, these large cities, and this is uh, in part due to things such as uh, war ivory, which in fact uh, war ivory makes up about 80% of the ivory uh, pieces of furniture from the High Middle Ages. That's a, from a study uh, uh, in, I want to say, like 2014. Uh, I'll, source, I'll cite the paper in the sources where they actually analyzed all of them and found that most of them were war ivory. And then we have the uh, Vinland colony, which is the uh, image you see uh, on top of the Greenland colony that was founded, um, it was discovered by Leif Erikson and 1000 CE. Um, he didn't really stay there uh, as a colony. He went to a, a lot of different places. Uh, it was really founded as a more permanent colony by Thorfinn Karlsvinny. Um, and for the longest time, uh, for many decades since the discovery of Lancel Meadows, the the uh, settlement that we're pretty sure uh, Thorfinn founded, it seemed like he'd only been there between five to ten years max. Uh, however, recent uh, evidence from 2018 actually determined that it had been used uh, as a seasonal camp uh, um, frequently uh, until the 1100s. So it was actually a colony that lasted for about 100 years. Now, they didn't stay there year round, 
They probably came uh, there during the spring, traded a little with um, the uh, ancestors of uh, various uh, confederations, uh, such as the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Huron Confederacy, as well as the uh, uh, Mi'kmaq and uh, other Algonquin-speaking peoples, um, and then went back in the winter. And it's also something to, important to note. Uh, when people hear about this, and this is a meme that you see so often on the internet that, oh, you know, the Norse came to America and didn't try to colonize, didn't kill the indigenous people, yada, yada, yada. Um, they could have if they wanted to. They, if they had wanted to, they, they would have. Because, uh, in fact, the Greenland saga and uh, Eric the Red saga talk about Leif Erikson's brother trying to do just that. He killed pretty much any indigenous American he came across. He didn't come across many, but he he did do that, and they did fight, uh, and eventually uh, Thorfinn had a run in with uh, the tribe where they laid siege to his uh, settlement and forced him out. Um, and again, this is why we, for the longest time, thought that uh, it had only lasted for about ten years, is because that went in the spring he decided after that attack he decided to go back. Um, and so it seemed like, oh, he never came back. Uh, and it's very likely that there's a saga, like a further saga, talking about the return that we that didn't exist, be, I'm sorry, that didn't survive, because unfortunately we know for a fact that there are a lot of sagas that didn't survive the test of time because we have mentions of them in other sagas, but they we don't have copies of them to examine. So there's certainly possible that, in fact, I think probable now, uh, now looking at the evidence, that that is the case, that while Thor, uh, Thorfinn left, uh, either, either he or some other group uh, returned, and they kept returning each year. Um, and it should also be important to note that uh, if, if a king so like Ivar or Nook the Great, that, who we'll cover in a minute, did decide to bring in a, a massive invasion force to uh, Newfoundland and uh, North America, they probably would have. Now, do, they, do I say they think they would have necessarily won? Who knows? I mean, this was around the time that uh, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy was forming. If it hadn't formed already, uh, there's some debate about whether or not it formed in 1000 CE or 1400 CE. But either way, it was um, already forming together, and so were other confederations. Um, so uh, who could field a lot of warriors themselves? So, you know, for me, it's still up for debate whether or not they would have necessarily succeeded. But the point is that if, they, if a king had decided that he wanted to, they most definitely would have, as seen in er uh, Leif Erikson's brother, who did try to do just that, albeit with only a few hundred men uh, and women. Um, and also <laughs> Freitas, uh, Freitas Eric's daughter, Leif Erikson's sister, tried to do the same thing. She was part of a battle too. Um, and maybe one of the inspirations for Shield Maidens. So, uh, And then we have the one of the two biggest empires uh, and this is where I'll pass it off to Beofeld again in a second, uh, Nook the Great's North Sea Empire. And what makes this different than even the Great Heathen Army is Nook the Great really went for the gold. He really wanted everything. And you can see this on this map. So the red are the is the territory that Nook the Great eventually ruled completely, with the yellow being allies, and the orange being vassal states. So he ruled all of Norway, all of England, all of Denmark, uh, most of northern, uh, sorry, of southern Sweden, uh, as well as uh, the, um, he had made vassals out of the Jans Vikings, who were uh, sort of predecessors, not really, but sort of predecessors to like the Knights Templar and such, uh, and had made vassal states out of the Irish. <laughs> the Norse kingdoms in Ireland, the Norse kingdoms in Scotland, and uh, Eastern Sweden. So he really went for the gold, and he was actually very brutal with his rule, uh, as Beofeld will cover in a minute. He uh, 
decided he didn't want most of the British nobility to rule, uh, and he went on a purge. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Beowulf. Well, I mean, um, the, the fact is, is that uh, that when we are looking at Knut the Great, uh, he is essentially like an Alexander the Great. Mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, th this is a pretty big empire for the time in which we're looking at. Uh, and for one king to be over all of this is just sort of remarkable. And it's also one reason why it didn't last very long. Uh, in the grand scheme of things is because, well, I mean, it's hard to keep hold of all of that if you're just one person. Uh, and so as far as England goes, um, he was in charge of England for uh, almost 20 years. Uh, and uh, <laughs> which is a, it's a pretty substantial amount of time. But at the same point, he doesn't remain king of England after uh, after that no and he you know and then there's that like i said he led purges against the royal family uh not to the same degree as william the conqueror who took it to an even larger level uh right. we'll over that in a minute but he did do that and uh i wanted to be felt i wanted to cover the nuts law code which is responsible for uh the final stamping out of a certain religion uh that's not christianity <laughs> in england <laughs> so so i'll let you cover that <laughs> all right so um we have a remarkable source for understanding uh, uh basically pagan survivals in law codes uh because these christian kings would sometimes roll in and would be appalled at the uh the paganness of their uh sort of like uh peasants, as it were. Uh, and so when we look at Newt's uh, uh, law code, we can see that there were some elements of paganism which had survived. Now, I'm of the opinion that it's sort of an overblown sort of interpretation, uh, mm -hmm. because if you are a, uh, if you are a, a, a more well <laughs> attuned to what Christianity should be, uh, you come across someone who's doing Christianity wrong, but they think that they're still Christian. Yeah. Um, are we really to say that they aren't Christian and that they're pagan? Or it's sort of a, a sort of a weird sort of like in between zone because they certainly weren't doing Christianity uh, by Knut's standards, uh, but uh, but they probably thought that they were doing Christianity, you know, at least somewhat right. But uh, let's just put it like this. Uh, uh, it allows us a glimpse to know that there were elements of paganism which had survived, uh, that, uh, that we can then learn what those elements were, and, uh, and we can sort of extrapolate what those might have, uh, have looked like on a, uh, at, at that point, they, a, a Christian sort of like, um, synchronization that had been going on perhaps mm -hmm. uh so long as the belief had been intact in christianity for uh for in christian gods a lot of other things were tolerated uh and under knut some of that toleration evaporates <laughs> almost immediately because <laughs> he was very devout very much so yes and he and and again this is where this the definition that uh we know of colonization uh, uh, colonization now comes in and that's because that's with um uh the his the idea that a foreign power imposes rule on a um another kingdom um again there's that idea of it being weaker but i take issue with that based off of at historical sources uh though in this case it's not necessarily wrong um because nut had a much larger army because he had already begun his, he sorry his father and his grandfather uh his father Sven fort beard and his grandfather harold bluetooth had already begun their expansion uh into uh scandinavia before then so what made nut the great's army different 
is rather than just having Danes in some Norwegians, he had Danes, he had Norwegians, he had Swedes, he had uh, Vins, uh, uh, Wins that are um, a group I'll cover in a minute that are uh, roughly around uh, in our in Eastern Europe. Uh, they had all these, they had mercenaries, they had the Young's Vikings who were, again, these highly trained uh, Norse mercenaries. Um, so he had a massive army, and not to mention the vassals from uh, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales, to at his disposal against England that had only about 50 years earlier come out of, uh, had only had pushed out the last uh, king of uh, the Danelaw, uh, Eric Bloodaxe. So this is an interesting case where, as he is, um, Bayfo put it, basically Alexander the Great uh, <laughs> came knocking on their door. Uh, so England still was, uh, at this point in time, was actually more unified uh, than when the Danelaw came in. It just happened that they rolled the they rolled the wrong side of the dice, and now you have uh, the most powerful uh, king in the north after the Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, invading your kingdom uh yeah. and this is why that happened and he, he went about imposing his rule with an iron fist i mean he he replaced all their sheriffs um you know all their constables with uh norse with danish and norwegian sheriffs he replaced the lords uh with uh with Scandinavian lords and divided England up into uh, four different provinces and gave them each to his best generals, including Thorkel the Tall, uh, who uh, is basically, if one could think of like uh, the Hulk in, uh, <laughs> in Norse mythology, <laughs> that would be him. He was described as being an absolute beast and terrifying. Uh, and then he went about slaughtering uh, not all but most of the British nobility uh, and replacing them with uh, Scandinavian nobles. Uh, and then his law code, where he stamped out what little bits and pieces of paganism may have been left. Uh, and he also replaced the bishops um, and other priests with uh, Norse and, uh, Scandinavian bishops. So this, again, fits right in with the definition of colonism that most people use. And so, yeah, and we actually could have seen something develop. Um, uh, considerably differently had his heirs not died heirless, yeah, uh, as it were. And so, uh, when we see uh, Narth Knut, uh, Harth Knut, uh, die with no, uh, no heir. Yeah. That sort of uh, spelled the end of what we're looking at here, because um, we could have seen a, a, a complete political unity between uh, all of these places had that sort of maintained itself under that family. Exactly. Uh, and it doesn't. And so uh, then a few years after that, we have uh, sort of a succession crisis. And then uh, we get uh, William the Bastard coming in. Yep. And funny thing is, something that a lot, a lot of people don't know and is not taught in history. Well, it's taught, uh, it's written in history books, but it's not taught uh, as much as I think it should be. The only reason William thought he had a claim to the English throne is because Edward the Confessor, the son of the English king uh, that Nut uh, defeated and conquered, fled to Normandy. Yeah. He only, he's the, the only reason he fled to Normandy was because of Nut. And it was while Edward the Confessor was in Normandy that he, it's, it's up for debate whether or not he actually <laughs> did it uh, or he lied or whether William was lying and just like, yeah, he was here and he told me I'm going to be king. Either way, the, the story goes, he told uh, William that he would make him his heir uh, to the English throne. And then probably once he was England in England, gave it to uh, Harold Godwinson, whom I mm -hmm. feel like is is probably had the more legitimate claim. He did. Uh, he did. He must. And then have, he got an arrow in the eye. Yeah, he, he got an arrow in the eye. But either way, the only so so the only so basically this North Sea Empire is uh, both directly and, in, and indirectly the reason that William uh, the Conqueror. Uh, 
because he'd actually started calling himself the Conqueror before then because he's the reason we see Normandy the size it is now because uh, he conquered quite a lot of territory and had, and until he fought his son uh, uh, Robert uh, the Duke of Normandy um, in battle he had never lost a battle period um, or at least so the sources say so <laughs> so yes they, so England can thank uh, note the great for William coming and conquering them. Uh, and so here we are, you know, it was, it was founded in 1016 CE by Note the Great of Denmark, and it consisted of Denmark, Norway, Sweden, England, and, and England included vassal states and allies in Wales and the Irish kingdoms, uh, Normandy, uh, the Sami of Finland, and Poland. Uh, and as I said, witnessed uh, multiple political purges, as well as the final nail on the coffin of Germanic paganism due to his strict uh, Christian law codes. Then we have the, as, as we were leading up to, the Norman Conquests. So the Norman Conquests uh, actually did not start with William. They actually started about 10 years earlier uh, in Italy uh, under uh, Robert, uh, Robert and Roger uh, of Hauteville. Uh, with Robert eventually given the name Giscard or the Terrible. <laughs> and so they were low level nobles uh, in Normandy. Uh, they were not uh, of the main Norman line uh, that William was. And so Robert and Roger decided, uh, along with their brother Richard, uh, not to be mistaken with Richard the Lionheart, uh, decided to go to Italy where they. Uh, heard riches could be made. And they, over the course of 1051 to uh, 1091, conquered all of Southern Italy, Italy, including Sicily, and made the Sicilian Norman kingdom that was actually wealthier than the Norman kingdom of England uh, that would eventually become the Angevin Empire. Um, and became the superpower, sorry, a superpower, not the, a superpower in the Mediterranean. Um, and then we have the conquests of England. Uh, the conquests of England, as we said, were started because William had claimed that Edward the Confessor made him the heir of the British throne. And so he, uh, at, after the death of Edward the Confessor, uh, uh, about a year later, promptly invaded England uh, with an army ranging between 7,000 to 10,000 and defeated uh, Harold Godwinson at the Battle of Hastings. Um, and he was probably, probably would have won it either way, but one of the ways he won it was uh, some of the soldiers had heard that he had fallen in battle and began to retreat. Uh, he quickly uh, reined them in and said, no, I didn't die, but it gave him an idea to do a succession of uh, feigned retreats uh, to weaken the line because then the Anglo-Saxon uh, military charged forward uh, and he was able to slaughter a good bit of them. It didn't end the battle uh, immediately. The battle did continue for several hours afterwards, but it's the one of the reasons he was um, able to win so handily. Again, being that he was the more experienced uh, warrior, because uh, he was a bastard, um, as Beofeld mentioned earlier, uh, <laughs> and so uh, every every duke in France uh, thought that, well, I'm going to take his land because he's not really the heir anyway, because he's a bastard, and so he had to fight literally his whole life to defend his kingdom against uh, these uh, French dukes. So he had, ne he, he had never seen a day of peace in his life, so he was very well, well versed in warfare. So again, he probably would have won either way. It just that Hastings probably wouldn't have been uh, the death blow uh, if not for that event. In fact, if, if, if Hastings had, would probably have been only one battle uh, and it would have been more protracted, but there is that. But after William conquered England, uh, he began, uh, he, he, he went not just for the gold, he went for the platinum in, in terms of slaughtering the Anglo-Saxon nobility. Like there was no one left in the Anglo-Saxon nobility. 
he he slaughtered them like we would see a factory farm uh and it was thorough and then he proceeded to march up to scotland and burn scotland to the ground too he didn't conquer scotland but he still did it <laughs> he still did it it's called his harrowing of the north um and then he also uh invaded a little bit of wales he didn't conquer it but he did invade it but what's important about what he did and his colonization for one thing uh he imposed french law on it uh and and french ideals um that actually were also a mix of norse ideals because again they the assimilation had only been officially uh complete 10 to 16 years earlier so you can't tell me that there wasn't still some uh scandinavian uh culture mixed in with that uh and he created this dynasty that lasted uh well into uh the 1400s actually um but what's interesting is it became known as the Angevin empire which is a more victorian term because they didn't call themselves that they just called themselves the kingdom of england uh but this anglo-norman kingdom began to expand um out uh into other areas they conquered m half of france uh through conquest and marriage uh they conquered uh a good chunk of Wales uh, and half of Ireland. And they were actually the ones who led the Third Crusade. Um, so why I'm bringing up these two cultures uh, is because while this is after the Viking Age, they are directly, uh, they, they are the direct results of the, this Norse colonization. And in fact, many historians call these events sort of like the long, I've seen one book I read recently by a, a PhD who specializes in this, he calls it the long arm of the Viking Age, because these were the descendants of Vikings, and they still acted like Vikings, and they still went out conquering like Vikings. And yes, uh, as Bedfo and I will, will tell you, Viking is a job, not a people. The proper terms are Dane. Uh, uh, Norwegian uh, or Swede or Norse or Nordic um, for a more general term, but the Normans acted like the Vikings that they were descended from because they were descended from these people with this profession and they acted like it. In fact, one interesting thing uh, is they replaced Thor and uh, Voden and Tyr for uh, the Archangel Michael in terms of uh, a war deity. Now, of course, Beowulf and I uh, will and have mentioned in our videos before that this idea that a deity is a god of something is not uh, necessarily correct because they can be god of, a god of multiple things. But the Normans did still replace these deities who uh, they invoked during war uh, with uh, the Archangel Michael, which is something that other kingdoms were not doing other cultures christian cultures were not doing they were invoking jesus or other uh god you know or other saints but not the archangel michael himself so that's another indicator that they still had that norse culture within them um and also they did not they uh did not necessarily slaughter uh the anglo-saxon populace they intermarried that's why they're called anglo norman uh, now, I, I would like to, uh, to point out here that, uh, that it is not an equitable arrangement. No. Uh, and the, uh, what we can see is it's left an indelible mark on the language of English. Yep. Um, and one of the things that we can see is in pro being proper. So uh, when, uh, when we look at words which are the proper term for things in English um, and that there's a vulgar term for them as well in most cases the uh, the vulgar term is descended from the uh, the the sort of Germanic root mm. uh, and then the proper term is uh, is then descended from the uh, the, the French the uh, the the sort of the the Latin root yeah uh, and so if we were to look at um, uh urinate 
that's a uh, the proper term for it uh, and defecate uh, and uh, the vulgar terms would uh, would be uh, uh, piss and shit. Yeah. Uh, and so the uh, the etymology of these words is is pretty clear that uh, that there's a a, a, a a bit of propriety that comes to it, but also uh, something as simple as the house. We live in houses, but manners are somehow better. Yeah. So if you were to live in a manor, uh, oh wow, you're you're really moving up in the world. Except for the fact that that's literally just house. <laughs> yeah. It's just house. It's yeah. just that it's in a different rooted word because these people were on top, uh, and they were the uh, the 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 head of the society. It's like we eat. Um, uh, the the foods that we eat uh, beef rather than cow uh, pork rather than uh, pig uh, things like that exactly and also uh, another thing everyone knows about Robin Hood and like the because uh, the the general like uh, the story most people are know of Robin Hood is like oh he became an outlaw because he killed a deer in the king's forest or whatever that was imposed by William the Conqueror. He wanted the forests to, uh, in the, uh, most of England, not all of it, but most of England to be reserved for him and his buddies from France to go and hunt in. He, he wanted it that and if you were, if you went and hunted in there without permission, you were to be arrested. Uh, or find sometimes he would find people very heftily, um, but he but that was it. And in fact, he created these uh, sort of sheriffs. Uh, I forget the term for them, but they're they're not really sheriffs, but they're people that he put in charge of uh, watching over the king's forests and other things. Uh, which is where we sort of get the image of uh, the ranger from, like, say D D or Lord of the Rings is people like these people he put in charge of watching over the forest and it was their job to stay in the forest most of the time they would probably have some sort of dwelling or some sort of outpost depending on how many were in one place uh to look over this so <laughs> so William was very a very strict ruler so were his descendants you this is where so this is why most people weren't allowed to hunt uh in the king's forest uh, at least big game like boar and deer they were allowed to hunt like rabbits and such but that doesn't feed a family but you can thank william the conqueror for that and so again fits right in uh with uh this whole idea of colonization is that they they imposed their outside law on these people and subjugated them uh and then uh, performed atrocities such as purging uh completely the nobility um in this kingdom and then therefore created an empire uh and we have to acknowledge that this is an extension of the viking age the idea that the normans were not uh don't count um i feel like is outdated um i feel like that's an outdated statement because then it cuts up it cuts up colonization colonization and time periods into these little tiny blocks that does isn't actually how it worked i mean look at uh say the idea of millennials millennials is from a broad time period of the 80s uh to the late 90s yet the 90s and 80s are divided up into their own little blocks so again um that's something that needs to go away and that's why norse colonization continued well into uh the uh 12th and 13th century and so you can see here what our talking points uh you know with uh the especially the sicilian norman kingdom uh while it wasn't quite as powerful militarily as the norman kingdom of england it became the more uh wealthy it became the wealthier uh of the two kingdoms uh, and it was still a, a powerhouse of its time uh it rivaled the byzantine empire uh and the muslim kingdoms and actually if you read harold hadrada's saga uh 
and also uh, read about the Varangian uh, Guard, who were um, mainly Danish, uh, Swedish, and Norwegian, uh, they battled with the Norman Sicilian Kingdom all the time. So, so there's that. And then we have this event right here, which is the Win the Windish Crusade, where uh, Denmark uh, was one of the main leaders of a crusade into um, what is now uh, Eastern Germany, such as Mecklenburg uh, and Pomerania. So what is it? Well, the, the Windish Crusade uh, started in 1147 CE, uh, after the Kingdom of Denmark and the Holy Roman Empire received the papal bull um, to crusade against the pagan Slavs of the Baltic coast. And they uh, expanded uh, into this region uh, and brutalized the area. Uh, the Danish kings used uh, longboats and Viking Age tactics to raid and destroy uh, villages and take slaves um, and burn down pagan temples, etc., et uh, with the help of Saxons uh, from the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, because, yes, Saxons did stay in Germany. Uh, some of them did go to Europe, <coughs> uh, to England, hence the uh, Anglo Saxon kingdom. But, <coughs> excuse me, uh, they did stay in Germany. Oh yeah, totally. Neater Saxon, for instance, uh, the Lower <laughs> Saxony. Uh, Saxons are still there. They're just Germans now. Exactly. Uh, and this resulted in the forced conversion of the Slavs, as well as uh, <clears throat> the Anakin. You're all right there, man. You you sound like you swallowed something wrong. <laughs> so, oh. <clears throat> One second. And it resulted to with the uh, annexation of the Holy Roman Empire, <clears throat> annexation of the region, excuse me, by the Holy Roman Empire, and also Denmark, though they eventually gave it up to Germany. <clears throat> because that's what the Holy Roman Empire is. It's just Germany under another name. So you get, you know, they call themselves the Holy Roman Empire because the Pope crowned Otto uh, the first, the first king of this kingdom is the Holy Roman Empire Emperor, which is just a figurehead title. He's just like you're my, you're my representative uh, in this in Europe, and you're the most powerful king. So, <laughs> but then also the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, was often, uh, the king was often excommunicated <laughs> by the Pope. It happened a lot because the kings of the Holy Roman Empire were uh, full of themselves, <laughs> much like a lot of European kings were, uh, but full of themselves to a larger degree. And they're like, well, I'm the Holy Roman Emperor. I don't have to listen to the Pope. And then the Pope will probably excommunicate uh, so they were neither, they were not Roman, they were German. Uh, they were not holy because they got excommunicated all the time. And they made up roughly of what modern day Germany looks like. So they weren't really an empire either, uh, which is the mean. So uh, a common mean. And then we have uh, the Swedish Crusades, uh, which uh, were uh, crusades by uh, Sweden against the pagan population of uh, Finland. And what's interesting about this crusade is uh, it's um, broken up into three different points, uh, but the, the first two points are sort of mythical uh, and sort of aren't. Like, we know actually that Sweden uh, was expanding into Finland during the uh, Viking Age, during the uh, thousands CE, uh, but we're not exactly sure when they began it. Um, and so this is where this whole myth of the first Swedish crusade comes in, is supposedly the king of Sweden at the time led it in the 1150s. Um, but we have no evidence for this textually, no papal bulls, uh, nothing. And the same goes for the second one. 
uh, where we we have some evidence of raiding, but we have no real paper paper bowls and no other sources, uh, and no other archaeological evidence showing that they did it at this time. What it really happened was uh, in 1293 in the third so-called Third Swedish Crusade, where both Sweden and the uh, in the Russian kingdom, which at the time was uh, a vassal state of the Mongol Empire, uh, were trying to uh, take over Finland um, with Sweden wanting to bring in Catholicism and uh, Russia wanting to bring in uh, Orthodox Christianity. <clears throat> and Sweden actually won uh, from this confrontation. And the result of this was uh, the forced com uh, conversion of the tribes of Finland and the annexation of uh, most of Finland into the Swedish kingdom. And what's most important, and why I'm bringing this in the Finnish crusade and uh, the next crusade up, is this set up the groundwork for the eventual subjugation uh, and atrocities done against the Sami peoples by the Swedish empire in the 1500s and 1600s. And further on, because it actually continued to the 1800s. In fact, uh, the Sami people um, suffered a lot of similar things that indigenous Americans did, uh, rather horrible things. And it was the, this crusade, uh, as well as the Vintage Crusade, um, that set up this precedent. And again, this is this long arm of the Viking Age, is they used Viking Age tactics against these peoples. They used uh, Viking tactics and and battle strategies and everything to do this. Um, so, and they were still uh, Scandinavian kings, because if we're going to say, oh, you know, the Viking Age is only because of a profession, well, that then we have to throw out the Great's Conquest and the Dane Law and uh, things like that, because those weren't Vikings in the profession, those were kings leading armies. So, Again, this is where this whole breaking up time periods into tiny little blocks doesn't make sense because that's not how history works. Um, so these these are definitely uh, extensions of the Viking Age and are definitely in the definition of colonization. And again, this is where where I said it again, the Scandinavians were the ones responsible for the spread of Christianity into these regions. And then the last crusade we have is the Livonian Crusade, um, which was a crusade by various military orders, uh, such as the Teutonic Knights and the Livonian Knights, uh, as well as the Danish and Swedish kingdoms against the pagan tribes of Livonia. Um, and it re resulted in the forced conversion of uh, the Livonians uh, and various other Slavic tribes uh, by, and the uh, sorry and the annexation of Livonia by multiple Christian kingdoms, including the Danes and the Swedes, uh, as well as the Teutonic Knights, because while the Teutonic Knights were technically vassals of the whole Roman, uh, Roman Empire, uh, they were building their own kingdom. They they this is where Prussia comes in. Prussia was a kingdom that they built for themselves. It was eventually absorbed by the German Empire uh, in the uh, late 1800s, but for the longest time, it was its own independent German state that was set up by the Teutonic Order. Uh, and we have the Danes and the Swedes to thank for this, where they brutalized these Baltic tribes with the help of the Teutonic Knights and other knightly orders uh, and converted them to Christianity, which again, uh, fits in the definition of uh, colonialism. So there you have it. The Danes, sorry, the, the Norse did colonize. Um, everything we looked at, whether it be as far back as the early 700s, well into the 13 and 1400s, uh, the Scandinavian peoples were most definitely colonizers. Again, they were not to the same level as, of a colonizer as um, say the French or the British or the Spanish from 1492 into the uh, 1900s, but they did a lot of the similar things. They did a lot of the same things, um, granted for different reasons, but they still did a lot of the same things. And to claim that they didn't do that 
to claim that they never colonized because, oh, they assimilated, or they claim they never colonized, oh, because they were kingdoms who were, uh, they were conquering kingdoms that were relatively equal, which again, doesn't fit with the narrative, even the narrative of uh, colonization in America, at least in the beginning, uh, is wrong. And to claim that they didn't commit the same atrocities or similar atrocities as the British uh, and Spanish uh, and even French and the colonization of America and India and Southeast Asia is wrong as well. Yes, again, not to the same uh, scope and not to the same necessarily brutality as what, say, the, the Belgians did in the Congo, but it, it's well within that definition, and we cannot ignore that we cannot ignore that because then it ignores the atrocities they committed uh and it continues this idea of what uh heathens like Bayfeld and i call brosatru or oh <clears throat> the the vikings were these manly men who <laughs> who came in there and asserted themselves and they were great because they were white uh and they weren't colonizing because they were just better than everybody. And that's not something we can allow to continue. Um, and we can't allow it to keep pulling away from the atrocities. We can't allow it to keep pulling away from uh, European colonization in the Americas because, as I said, it perpetuates that idea of uh, one has to be more powerful than the other, and therefore they deserve to win. Which again is a, uh, as Bayfield will will tell you, it's a, another sign, something that Brosatru still do, uh, mm -hmm. and we fight that constantly, and that's why we came here today to tell you this, to go in depth, because uh, one, it's too much to do on any social media like say Facebook or anything like that, but it's important, it's integral that this be taught. Um, and so with that, um, I'm going to get off my high horse, uh, and I don't know if Bayfeld uh, has anything he wants to add to that rant I just did. <laughs> uh, uh, but if he doesn't, we're going to end this video, and I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you uh, like and share and subscribe, uh, and you have a good day. Um, well, thank you so much for having me on here. Yeah, no problem at all.